Today, we're going to talk about the nephron, the functional unit of the kidney. Blood enters through the renal artery and flows through the afferent arteriole into the glomerulus, where solutes are pulled into the Bowman's capsule. Let's take a closer look. In the glomerulus, we're going to filter out potassium, sodium, chloride, ammonia, urea, glucose, and some water, and hydrogen ions and amino acids. A lot of this stuff is valuable to the body and will be reabsorbed later. I like to think of it kind of like a security checkpoint, where the guards dump out everything in your backpack for inspection and then give most of it back later. Remember that in a healthy glomerulus, we do not filter out red blood cells or proteins. Damage to the glomerulus can cause proteins to seep through, which is why doctors will sometimes test for proteins in the urine as an indicator of kidney disease. The filtrate moves from Bowman's capsule into the proximal tubule, where a lot of solvents are pulled back into the blood. This is called reabsorption. About two-thirds of the sodium and chloride return to the blood. We also reabsorb glucose. In a healthy person, virtually all of the glucose will be reabsorbed into the blood. However, for someone who's severely hyperglycemic, the glucose transporters won't be able to work fast enough. Some of the glucose will remain in the urine. So a urine test can be a useful indicator for diabetes. I haven't pictured it here, but we're also going to reabsorb virtually 100% of the amino acids along with the glucose. Since we've actively transported a lot of solutes, we're also going to passively reabsorb a lot of water molecules. We'll also reabsorb about 50% of the urea. So you can see that the proximal tubule does the lion's share of the work reabsorbing stuff. It's also worth mentioning that the proximal tubule has a brush border, which means there are little fuzzy-looking microvilli that increase the surface area and help with reabsorption. If you dissect a kidney, you can actually see this. The inside of the proximal tubule looks kind of dirty, while the other tubules look clean and smooth. After the filtrate passes through the proximal tubule, it proceeds to the loop of Henle. The descending limb is permeable to water, but not ions, while the ascending limb is permeable to ions, but not water. On the thick ascending limb, we pump out a bunch of ions. This creates a concentration gradient. On the descending limb, the water passively flows into the area of higher concentration. So this is a really clever way of reclaiming water from the filtrate. Desert animals tend to have really long loops of Henle because they need to be very efficient at conserving water. After the loop of Henle, the filtrate moves on to the distal tubule. We'll continue to reabsorb a little bit of sodium and chloride, but for the most part, we're left with the waste products. The four major waste products that you should remember are urea, potassium, ammonia, and hydrogen. My biology teacher showed me a mnemonic to remember this, dump the hunk, where H is for hydrogen, U is for urea, N is for ammonia, as in NH3, and K is the elemental symbol for potassium. This leftover stuff will drain into the collecting duct. By the time we get here, filtration and reabsorption is pretty much over. The collecting duct connects to the ureter, which goes to the bladder, where urine is stored until it can be excreted. However, the collecting duct is still important in terms of regulation. We can reabsorb a little bit of water and sodium from the collecting duct, and this can be regulated through hormones. For example, let's look at the steroid aldosterone. Aldosterone causes more ions to be pumped out of the collecting duct and distal tubule. This draws out water, which increases blood volume. Aldosterone is known as an antidiuretic because it decreases urine output and increases blood volume. Another type of antidiuretic is ADH, or antidiuretic hormone also known as vasopressin. This hormone works a little differently. It makes the collecting duct more permeable to water. So both of these hormones are antidiuretics, but there's a key difference you should notice. 
Aldosterone increases blood volume by reabsorbing both ions and water, so there's no change in blood osmolarity. ADH increases blood volume by reabsorbing only water, which lowers blood osmolarity. The last thing I want to mention is that you should notice how almost all of the tubules are geared towards reabsorbing sodium. The human body doesn't really have a good way of getting rid of sodium. Almost every step in the process is geared towards conserving sodium. This made sense for our ancestors when sodium was scarce, but the modern American diet is loaded with sodium. Since sodium causes more water to be retained, this increases blood pressure and chronically high blood pressure can lead to heart disease. So please let me know in the comments if you have any questions. I have other educational videos you can check out if you'd like to learn more about human physiology and biochemistry. Anyway, I'll see you in the next video. Have a great day!